to be understood was my desire. Along with that was my desire not to have the ignorant tell my story when I'm gone, which is what would have happened had I not told it myself. If I hope for anything as an artist, it's that I inspire certain people to be who they really are. She'd asked me where the welts on my legs came from, or about the massively swollen black eye I once had. She'd say, it's your mother, isn't it? But I'd deny it. If my mother found out I'd told, she'd murder me. I felt bad lying to Mrs. Shields because she's lovely. I don't know why she likes me, but she does. I'd like to be her girl. I'd like to be going home with her every afternoon. She'd look like she was about to cry whenever I said it wasn't my mother. I'm jealous when I see the other girls walking down Marion Avenue after school with their mother's arms around them. That's because I'm the kid crying in fear on the last day of term before the summer holidays. I have to pretend I lost my field hockey stick because I know my mother will hit me with it all summer if I bring it home. But she'll just use the carpet sweeper pole instead. She'll make me take off all my clothes and lie on the floor and open my legs and arms and let her hit me with the sweeping brush in my private parts. She makes me say I am nothing over and over. And if I don't, she won't stop stomping on me. She says she wants to burst my womb. She makes me beg her for mercy. I was standing in Black Rock Station with my sister after school, waiting for our train to Glenageary. A train passed through at full speed and a blonde boy of about 14 in a grey school uniform opened the door on the racing train and it hit me on the right side of my head. I was bleeding so much that my grey school gabardine was soaked from shoulder to knee. But my sister and I just got on our own train when it came, got off at our stop, then walked up the long hill home about a mile. My mother was cross that I hadn't kept my ticket so she could sue the train people. The doctor came and put stitches in my head while I lay on the couch. I had very long hair. My hair was caked with blood by the time he was finished, but he said I wasn't to wash it for a month for some reason, so it got very smelly. He also said I was to sleep in my mother's room and she was to watch me in case I went unconscious. I had a nice time with her then. She made me a bed on the floor, and during the day when the others were at school, she taught me how to blanket stitch and made me banana milkshakes. That's why when I got back to school, I put on the fainting act, so she'd keep me home and love me. My mother herself is addicted to stealing, has been for as long as I can remember. When the collection plate is passed around at mass, she takes money out of it rather than putting money in. When the new traffic circle was made at Avondale Road, she drove down in the night with trowels and black rubbish bags to steal the just planted baby bushes. And when they planted new bushes, down she went again and took those. I don't know what she did with them. When she was in hospital, she took the crucifix off the wall. She even sent me home with the weighing scales from her hospital room under my school gabardine. She goes to visit houses that are for sale just so she can steal trinkets. She has a gazillion books, all piled about three feet high on the floor all around her bedroom. She stole every one of them. She steals everything. I am addicted to stealing too. That's why I like to sing hymns. It isn't bearable to be such a bad person. I have to do one holy thing so I can live with myself. There's a big house full of priests up the road from my school. I knocked on the door one morning instead of going to class. A lady just a bit older than my mother opened the door and I said I wanted to see a priest by myself. He was a gentle, nice priest with dark hair. He wasn't very old and he had a calm voice. We talked for ages. I told him I was a thief and that God could see me and that I was a terrible person, which I am. I told him everything I told the sergeant today, and I told him how I had stuck my wooden stilts in the fire at home and tried to walk across the carpet with them in flames. He listened really carefully, 
and after a while he asked me what job did I think I might like when I'm an adult. I told him I liked singing. He said, ah, did you know that he who sings prays twice? I said, I didn't know, Father, but I think it must work for girls too because I can sing my mother to sleep with Don't Cry For Me Argentina. He said, and don't you remember a thief died beside Christ and was rewarded with paradise because he was penitent. He asked me what girl singers I liked. I told him I loved Randy Crawford. He made me promise him that when I get a job, I'll give back all the money I took. He said then I would be square with God. He said I could go busking if I didn't want to wait, but I don't know how to play guitar. I just carry my brother's guitar case empty around Black Rock so everyone will think I'm cool. But I'm going to keep my promise. I only ever had one sex education lesson in my life. A plump old nun stomped into our classroom one afternoon. We'd never seen her before. We had not the slightest idea why she was there. She picked up the chalk without uttering a word and in one stroke drew a giant erect penis pointing toward the ceiling. It must have been about a foot tall with a massive pair of balls underneath. Before she'd finished drawing, we were on the floor laughing, literally clutching ourselves so we wouldn't piss. And by the time she swiveled round to begin whatever speech she'd had in mind, she was already scuppered. She had lost control of the room. We couldn't get up. It never struck her to erase the penis. Instead, she stood in front of it, pleading for order over and over to no avail. Eventually, she ran out of the room, and that was the end of sex ed. Okay, I did a bad thing, but I didn't know it was bad, so it isn't a sin. That's what the Bible says anyway. If I were to do it again now, that I know it's a sin, it would be a sin. As long as I never do it again, I'm grand. I was sitting in pizza land with my friend, showing her a funny finger pointy trick my father taught me years ago. A waiter thought I was calling him over. I wasn't, but it became apparent he thought I was flirting with him. And then he started flirting away with me. This was rather flattering because he was American and consequently gorgeous bleached blonde, semi-dreadlocked hair and the cool accents. I'm only 14, but when he asked me what age I was, I said 18. I had on a ton of makeup, so he believed me. American men are cool. They're never squares. Irish men are total squares. There is nothing sexy about them. This poor waiter, Paul was his name, flirted away with me thinking I was 18. I had never had sex before, so when he asked me to go to his flat in Smithfield with him, it never struck me it was sex he had in mind. Genuinely, I thought we'd kiss and stuff like people my age do, but not have sex. Once we'd been kissing for a while, though, it became apparent that the whole enchilada was required. I thought, well, I have to lose the virginity at some point. Most of my friends have done it. I wasn't cool at all because I hadn't. This was my big chance. I climbed into the bed with him, excited, even though I was also really nervous. I'm in the bed with this American, Paul, thinking, oh God, what do I do? But I didn't really get time to worry long. As soon as he attempted to get inside me, he realized I'd never had sex before because he couldn't get in at first, and eventually I bled. Afterward, he figured out I wasn't 18, and when I admitted I was 14, he nearly had a heart attack made me get dressed straight away and then walked me in the dark to get a bus home, all the while imploring me never to lie about my age again, because apparently it's illegal to have sex with someone if they aren't 18, and he could get into trouble with the police. On the bus, I wondered if I looked different. Would the passengers say to themselves, there's a girl who isn't a virgin anymore, and consequently think me cool? I'm staring at the reflection of my eyes in the window of the back seat of my father's car. I'm thinking it will always be the same two eyes looking at me all my life. I made him stop at the record shop so I could buy a copy of Bob Dylan's Desire. 
I left my mother's house months ago. I like Viola, my stepmother. She's very slim. She's from the north of Ireland with a soft accent and a soft voice and always a huge toothy smile. She has short blonde hair and she can speak fluent French. She likes calligraphy and teaches me some. Very rarely she will have one glass of sherry and have to be helped to bed. She's so innocent. She adores the ground my father walks on. I dearly wish that she were my mother. Sometimes I'm angry at her because she isn't. I was cross with her for not meeting my father earlier. My mother said we're not allowed to like my stepmother. When we go driving through town, she point out shops where she said my stepmother buys clothes and say, only whores go there. And she point out hotels and clubs too and say the same. It made me and my sister laugh and want to go to all those places. She said, only whores pierced their ears. So I got my ears pierced a few days after I left her. Got my hair cut real short too, because only whores do that. The reason my siblings and I lived with her then was that my mother lost custody of us because the day my father left her, she put us to stay in a hut he'd built in the garden. Once he'd gone, we started crying. She said if we loved him so much, we could go and live in the hut. I knelt on the ground in front of the gable wall and wailed up to the landing window to get her to let us into the house when it got dark. But she never responded. And off went the light in her bedroom and everything went black. That is when I officially lost my mind and also became afraid of the size of the sky. I've actually been thrown out of like three schools in the past nine months and I still keep getting caught stealing. If a thing ain't nailed down, I'm stealing it. I don't even know why. It's got so bad, my stepmother called in a social worker, Irene. I hate her. I got caught stealing a pair of gold shoes for my friend to wear to the Pretenders concert. I stole outfits for my friends because I'm the second fastest sprinter in the class. I just put the clothes on in the shops and run. Irene told my father and my stepmother to send me off to this place I'm now on the way to in my father's car, looking at my own two eyes in the window, knowing they're the same eyes I'll see all my life. The place is called Ungrianon, the sunrise. There were maybe four hospital beds against each wall with curtains drawn around them, just like a real hospital. Everything was coloured buttermilk, the linoleum, the curtains, the walls. The lights were very low and dark yellow and seemed to shine from behind the walls so that they leaked up the back of the cubicles. Since no staffers were present, I stood waiting, expecting someone to come and say where I should sleep. I heard moaning from one of the beds. Someone was calling, nurse, nurse. After 10 minutes, no one came, so I stole a quick peek into each cubicle. Every bed had in it an ancient lady sleeping. I'd been in hospitals before and seen some dying people, so I recognised this was a tiny hospice. And I recognised these were some of the old ladies I sometimes saw shuffling about the grounds, the ladies we were never allowed to talk to. I'd been sent up here to sleep by Sister Margaret as punishment for the most recent of several successful escapes, all of which had resulted in much busking and entering of talent shows at hotels around Dublin, where I would always win the fiver if I sang Don't Cry For Me Argentina. The final time I ran away, I made a big mistake. I brought another girl with me, an older girl. She ended up shagging a guy against the wall of a block of flats and his friends ran off with all her stuff. So I got scared and went back to Grianon. The girl didn't come back for about two weeks. I never saw my stuff again, but luckily I hadn't lost my new guitar because I'd never put it down. The old ladies don't lift their feet much when they go around the edges of the building like rows of ducks behind no mother. All seems unnaturally reversed because there's always a nun behind them. The lady's slippers make a shh, shh sound and I get such a strange feeling when I see them. 
alarmed by the courtyard I can't cross to quiz them. They all hold their chins to their chests and hold their hands clasped across their wounds and it makes them look as if they've murdered someone and are praying for forgiveness or as if they're a line of slaves in ghostly silent shackles on their way to auction. Stayed that night in the one bed I found that didn't have anyone in it. All through the night the lady next to me called out in a frightened voice. Other ladies called out sometimes too, but no one came. I rolled half asleep, half awake, trying to figure out why Sister Margaret had gone to such an extreme. The usual punishment is that you were put in Coventry and you have to sleep on your mattress on the floor outside your room and eat on your own. You're not nice again until after all the girls wash their clothes in the laundry. I never ran away again after my night in the hospice. In the morning when I woke, I knew what Sister Margaret had been trying to tell me. The worst part was, I knew she wasn't being unkind. She was being a nun I'd never seen before. She deliberately hadn't told me why I was to go to a part of the building I'd never known existed. Climb a flight of stairs I would never have been allowed to ascend if I'd asked to. Knock on a door which I would previously not have been permitted to touch and enter such a scene with no staff present. She let me figure it out for myself. If I didn't stop running away, I would someday be one of those old ladies. They start letting you out now and then to get you used to the world of work. You do the odd day in the office or typing pool that you're gonna be working in. When the girl in the cubicle next to mine, the one who looks like a dark Audrey Hepburn, started this process, she met a boy from Glenageary, which is where I'm from. She and this boy fell in love and she got pregnant. She was very happy about it and really excited and proud. She was, of course, in trouble with the nuns. The baby was a boy, so white his skin was blue and his hair was black as night. She fussed over him and took care of him and all his little clothes, just as she had formerly fussed over herself. She adored him. I loved holding him. I loved his little noises. I loved the smell of her on his little head. He looked like baby Moses, all wrapped up in his blue and white blanket, ready to float up the Nile in his reed basket. I don't know if she knew they weren't going to let her keep him. I don't know if we knew, but I don't think we did. I got such a shock is why I can't remember when they took him from her arms and he was gone. Someone told me that in Ireland, you can't keep your baby if you're under 18 and not married. Now she's gone too, even though her body is still here. She doesn't shape her nails. She doesn't do her makeup. She doesn't dress nice anymore. She never smiles or speaks. All she does is cry her poor heart out all day. She says they didn't give him to his father and she doesn't know who they gave him to. I managed to talk my father and sister Margaret into letting me go to the school across the road to do my intercert. I wasn't entirely lying when I told them I wanted to write about the poems and the stories. We never had enough time with John to study them. But my main objective was not to end up a nun or a locked up old lady or working in a typing pool or having to be a housewife. It was partly Sister Margaret's fault I kept running away. She shouldn't have bought me that guitar. When she brought me to the shop, I chose an acoustic steel string so I could be like my big brother Joe. As she was paying, I browsed the shelves and found a book of Bob Dylan's songs with lyrics and pictures of how to play the chords. I made her throw it in. She said she'd get a teacher to come in if I would like. And one day, Along came this lovely lady called Jeanette, who spoke with a very English accent and was therefore neither square nor boring. My father cried over my mother's body, said, I'm sorry, Mary, over and over. That made me angry too. Why sorry now and not before? Why no I'm sorry from either of them to the four of us? Why conduct a war? 
and then say sorry when someone is dead. I ran away out of the funeral home, down the road through Glastool and into Dunleary. I don't think I'll ever stop running. I don't know how I'll ever not be angry. Nothing is ever going to be fixed now. The next day, as we were waiting in my father's sitting room for the funeral cars, I decided to smoke myself to death. Decided that I would smoke and smoke all my life, as many cigarettes as it took to send me to my mother. I can't remember anything from the funeral but feet around the grave. I looked down. We all did, crying. Best day of my life was the day I first left Ireland, and any other day I left Ireland was the next best. Happened to be someone up there likes me, so in 1985, a fortnight or so after we buried my mother, don't worry, we made sure she was dead first. Ensign Records got in touch with me via a guy named Kieran Owens, whom I had met while singing with Tonton McCoot, a band I had joined the previous summer. It was named after the Haitian secret police, a terrible name chosen by the band leader and bass player Colm Farrelly, who fancied himself something of a witch. I had put an advert in Hot Press, Ireland's only music magazine, saying I was a singer looking for a band. I tramped about the suburbs of Dublin, auditioning in people's garages and sitting rooms, settling finally on Tonton because it didn't seem likely to be a square situation, musically speaking, where the others had. Colm's utter madness being the deciding factor. He had also agreed we could do some of my songs, while the other bands had not. The other bands would have had me singing Summertime for the rest of my life, and I'd rather have poked my own eyes out. Tom Tom lasted about a year. The big shot record executive Nigel Grange and Chris Hill of Ensign were inclined to scout Ireland for acts because they'd had the Boomtown Rats and Tin Lizzy. Kieran Owens was one of their go-to guys for advice on what was hot or not around town. He had taken them to a gig of ours six months previously. Now they'd tracked me down, though, through Kieran and called me, said they wanted me to come to London and make some demos with Carl Wallinger from the Waterboys, and asked how soon could I do so. They said they didn't want the band, just me, which suited me fine, because we had some weeks previously discovered that Colm had been squirreling away any money we earned for himself, and so the band had broken up. I jumped on a plane within 48 hours of Ensign calling me, with the help of a hundred quid kindly offered to me by the lovely boss of the restaurant where I was working, the badass cafe in Dublin, where myself and all the other waitresses wore white t-shirts that said, nice pizza ass. I kid you not, I actually didn't realize what it meant until I was about 28. I demoed four songs with Carl, three of which eventually made it onto my first album, The Lion and the Cobra. Nigel is a square unto high heaven, as anyone with Nigel for a name is bound to be. He and Chris invited me down to Ensign a few days ago. I had lunch with them at Cannes, and halfway through it, Nigel announced he'd like me to stop cutting my hair short and start dressing like a girl. He was disapproving of my recent attempt at a very short mohawk. He said himself and Chris would like me to wear short skirts with boots and perhaps some feminine accessories such as earrings, necklaces, bracelets and other noisy items one couldn't possibly wear close to a microphone. When he finished speaking, I said to Chris, who had been nodding his head in silent agreement with Nigel's every word, so let me get this straight. He wants me to look like your mistress and the bird he left his wife for. Silence as I stood up and gathered my keys and ciggies. Chris had such a great face. The huge eyes on him couldn't disguise his admiration for the observation or for the mischievousness of finding it so amusing. When I told Faulkner about events, he said, I think you should fucking shave your head. So I went to the barber the next day 
Greek place by a bathhouse near Ensign, and I could call into them straight after the deed was done. I had arranged to swing by on the pretense of having receipts to give Doreen, their lovely secretary, who was a reasonable, older, blonde-haired lady. The man running the barbershop that day was maybe 26. I was 19. He was indeed Greek, mildly plump, short black hair, dark five o'clock shadow. Clearly he'd been left in charge by himself, and despite the fact he had no customers but me, he was in somewhat of a flap. I slid into his red leather chair and announced, I want to look like a boy. And when it dawned on him exactly what I meant, which because I didn't speak any Greek, I made clear by a series of hand gestures that I think might have at first confused him. He went running for the phone on the wall, maybe to call the owner, tears beginning to well up in his eyes. There was no answer. He was all alone. Please don't make me do it, please, he beseeched, hanging up the phone and walking towards me with his hands held as if in prayer. What will your father say? He uttered with a very sharp intake of breath. And what will your brother say? He said as he let it out. Then another sharp breath in and a horrified pause. And then, oh my God, what will your boyfriend say? Oh my God, it's not right to do for Gerald. When he finished, I stood up to face him and one tear rolled down his right cheek. Me, I loved it. I looked like an alien. I looked like Star Trek. Didn't matter what I wore now. When I walked through Ensign, I got stunned silence from Nigel. Doreen, with her back to him, gave me a silent double thumbs up with a playful smile. And Chris asked me to sit in the car with him later. Why have you done it? Because I want to be me. Can't you be you if I are? I said, it's you who needs hair, you baldy old fecker, not me. Saturday morning, I bought a test from the chemist before I went to the studio. Had to pee in a tiny glass tube that had a small globule of light yellow jelly inside. And then sit the tube in a little holder that had a small mirror underneath, in which soon a lovely pink circle appeared. Beautiful looking thing it was too, like a little planet. I immediately ran and grabbed a cushion from one of the studio reception area sofas and dashed back to the bathroom so as to stuff it up my jumper so I could see what I'd look like all fat with a baby. I turned myself this way and that in the mirrors and jumped up and down with excitement, so happy. John was the father and when I told him my news the next day at Hammersmith Market, he was shaken. I fell totally out of love with him and my heart closed. I couldn't have sex with him anymore. I didn't tell him why because I felt guilty. So I told him there must be something wrong with me in the sex department. When I told Nigel, he smiled nicely and said I should go to Ensign's house doctor to initiate my pregnancy care. I went the next evening. The doctor told me Nigel had already called him and expressed the wish that he, the doctor, would impress upon me the following, which he, the doctor, said in the following words. Your record company has spent a hundred thousand pounds recording your album. You owe it to them not to have this baby. Furthermore, he informed me that if I flew while pregnant, my baby would be damaged. And anyway, if I was going to be a musician, I ought not have babies because a woman shouldn't leave her baby to go on tour. And at the same time, a child can't be taken on tour. I haven't cried so much in years. Nigel could shove his 100,000 and his producer. I'm starting again. The tour I best remember was actually for my second album, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got. At this stage, I had a new manager, Steve Farnoli, who had been Prince's manager. And because Nothing Compares to You on the album had been number one, it was suddenly a whole other world for me on tour. There was a stylist, lighting guys, there was a production, all kinds of pomp and ceremony. I found it hard to get used to because I had a lot of stage fright and I felt like a total imposter. I couldn't understand why anybody liked my songs 
or why anybody clapped or thought they were good. I really had no self-esteem when it came to songs or anything else. And I'd be playing these festivals or carnivals and there'd be people screaming nearby on roller coasters, people screaming in terror. And I'd be singing soothing songs to the audience. It was just the weirdest thing, triggering actually. I also got into the habit of singing with my eyes closed, which really upset my manager. I came to prefer it for a number of reasons, including the fact that if you made eye contact with someone's boyfriend, you got scared his girl was going to beat you up afterwards, especially if you were doing a romantic song. We were making the video for Nothing Compares to You. We'd already shot most of the video in London a few days ago, maybe three setups. In one, a close-up, I just sang the song along with the track, sitting in a chair wearing a black polo neck. But in the part where it says, all the flowers that you planted, Mama, in the backyard, all died when you went away, I cried for like 20 seconds. I think that means I wasted their time. I did manage to get my act together and keep singing, but I think it's unusable, so it's good we're shooting all this stuff in Paris. I feel bad I wasted everyone's time and money, though. John Maybury, who again directed my video, thought I was crying because me and Faulkner had recently parted ways, but I'm happy about that now. It's better for everyone. I was crying about my mother being dead. I'm still really messed up about it, even though I'm 24. A little embarrassing, but there you go, I'm a girl. In the showbiz parts of Los Angeles, the white walls have beautiful dark pink flowers. The Mexicans live elsewhere, so do the African Americans. The only time you see those people, they're cleaning someone's house. In the New York office of my record company, the color of the employee's skin is darkest in the basement, which is in the mail room. Their skin gets lighter as the floors go up, as do the stations the employees have their radios tuned to. Two floors up from the top, no females becomes the scenario also, unless they're in secretarial roles. The bosses didn't like the album cover shot for The Lion and the Cobra, so we had to have a different one for America, but from the same series. They felt I looked angry on the European one, I look like I'm screaming. In fact, I was singing. The very clever photographer made me sing along to my record, which he had cranked up real loud. So it's just what I look like when I'm singing. But the bosses liked the demure look, the one where I'm looking at the floor and my mouth is shut. Apparently females seeming angry doesn't shift units and they're already handicapped by my hair. The people who run the music industry aren't punk at all. They're a bunch of frightened people, but frightened of the wrong thing, namely music. Hence, in 1991, there was a rap category at the Grammys, but they didn't televise the award. So there was a boycott amongst the rap community. Hence, I once had Public Enemy's logo shaved and dyed onto the side of my head, so it would be seen on telly all around the world. Showbiz just got real interesting. The kids are beginning to revolt, and no one has been revolting since John Lennon died. Rap is the hugest thing in America. All you see are teenagers, referred to as kids by the establishment, sitting on steps with enormous boom boxes, blaring Public Enemy or KRS-One so loud that the bass would nearly make you defecate or lugging the boom boxes around the streets on their shoulders like they're walking the stations of the cross. Similar to Christ's, rap's mission is self-esteem for those previously deemed shit. So it's as dangerous as Christ's because a lot of kids of all manner are listening and no one in the industry wants their top floors threatened by either the wrong skin color or the wrong mindset. That is, anyone who cares about the truth. Kids are the market, but you have to keep them believing they're worth less than the stars or they won't think they need what stars are selling. Wait till you see. When showbiz execs realize they can't kill rap, they will hijack it. 
They'll make millionaires of imposter rappers who say things like, you can't be like me. The day my mother died, myself and my siblings went inside her house for the first time in several years, our own secrets to seek, not hers. There were still broken plastic swans in the bathroom, resolute, long-necked, frozen, as if nothing had happened. I took down from her bedroom wall the only photo she ever had up there, which was of Pope John Paul II. It was taken when he visited Ireland in 1979. Young people of Ireland, he had said after making a show of kissing the ground at Dublin airport like the flight had been overly frightening. I love you. What a load of claptrap. Nobody loved us, not even God. Sure, even our mothers and fathers couldn't stand us. My intention had always been to destroy my mother's photo of the Pope. It represented lies and liars and abuse. The type of people who kept these things were devils like my mother. I never knew when or where or how I would destroy it, but destroy it I would when the right moment came. And with that in mind, I carefully brought it everywhere I lived from that day forward, because nobody ever gave a shit about the children of Ireland. I've woken after going to bed at 6 a.m., it's 1 p.m., only a few hours until camera rehearsal for SNL. I'm to perform two songs, the second of which is Bob Marley's War, a cappella. The lyric is actually a speech given to the United Nations by the Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie in New York in 1963 about racism being the cause of all wars. But I'm going to change a few lines to be a declaration of war against child abuse I found a tiny article buried in the back pages of an Irish newspaper about families whose children had been abused by priests, but whose stories were not believed by the police who had lost their files, inverted commas. So I've been thinking even more of destroying my mother's photo of JP2. And I decide tonight is the night. I bring the photo to the NBC studio and hide it in the dressing room. At the rehearsal, when I finish singing Bob Marley's War, I hold up a photo of a Brazilian street kid who was killed by cops. I ask the cameraman to zoom in on the photo during the actual show. I don't tell him what I have in mind for later on. Everyone's happy. A dead child far away is no one's problem. I know if I do this, there'll be war, but I don't care. I know my scripture. Nothing can touch me. I reject the world. Nobody can do a thing to me that hasn't been done already. I can sing in the streets like I used to. It's not like anyone will tear my throat out. Showtime. I'm wearing a white lace dress that once belonged to Shade. I bought it at a rock and roll auction in London when I was 19. Paid 800 pounds for it. It's beautiful. There's a coin-sized lead weight in each side of the slit at the back to keep it straight and make it hang ladylike. Very clever. A dress for women to behave badly in. One day maybe I will have a daughter who gets married in it. So the show goes on. First song, success has made a failure of our home, is a dream. Plenty of people milling about backstage afterwards. Producers, managers, makeup artists and fellow guests. I'm the flavour of the month. Everyone wants to talk to me, tell me how I'm a good girl, but I know I'm an imposter. Second song is set up beautifully, with one candle beside me and my Rasta prayer cloth tied to the microphone. I sing war a cappella. No one suspects a thing, but at the end, I don't hold up the child's picture. I hold up JP2's photo and then rip it into pieces. I yell, fight a real enemy. Total stunned silence in the audience. And when I walk backstage, literally not a human being is in sight. All doors have closed. Everyone has vanished, including my own manager who locks himself in his room for three days and unplugs his phone. Everyone wants a pop star, see? but I'm a protest singer. I just had stuff to get off my chest. I had no desire for fame. 
In fact, that's why I chose the first song, Success Was Making a Failure of My Life, because everybody was already calling me crazy for not acting like a pop star, for not worshipping fame. And I understand I've torn up the dreams of those around me, but those aren't my dreams. No one ever asked me what my dreams were. They just got mad at me for not being who they wanted me to be. My own dream is only to keep the contract I made with God before I ever made one with the music business. And that's a better fight than murder. I got to get to the other side of life. I am in my dressing room with my personal assistant, Kira. We pack up my bags and leave the building. Outside 30 Rock, two young men are waiting for me and they throw a load of eggs at us both. But what they don't know is myself and Kira are able to run 100 meters in 11.3 seconds. So we run after them when they flee. We catch up with them in some alley. They are leaning, gasping for breath against a black fence they didn't have the strength to climb. All we say laughing at them is, hey, don't be throwing eggs at women. The two of them are so shocked at being chased and caught that they start laughing too, and it all ends very friendly. They straighten up and help us find a cab back to the hotel. The matter is being discussed on the news, and we learn that I'm banned from NBC for life. This hurts me a lot less than rapes hurt those Irish children. I'm on tour in America, and in some towns and cities, people have been steamrolling piles of my albums at intersections. Bring us your Sinead O'Connor album and we'll crush it for you, <laughs> has been the arrangement. Forward, reverse, forward, reverse, over the little hills of CDs. Intensely angry old people with very pointy noses operating the steamrollers. I don't think I've ever seen anything so funny, nor has the Irish artist in me ever been more proud, especially today when wearing a pair of sunglasses and a wig outside the venue at New York's Saratoga Performing Arts Centre between soundcheck and showtime, I had the great joy of joining with my best friend Kira in a protest against myself. In fake American accents, we chatted with the five or so Vietnam veterans who were the only people who had turned up at a protest promoted by a local disc jockey. They were large, shall we say, all male, and three of them were wearing black framed enormous round spectacles with lenses so thick their eyes looked humongous. They had painstakingly made and were proudly carrying placards that left no one in any doubt that they felt I should leave America immediately and that all Sinead O'Connor loves about America is the dollar. Needless, I hope, to point out they were mistaken. Only an Egypt wouldn't love America. Plus, only an Egypt would leave America for any reason other than deportation. Whatever else I might be fairly or otherwise accused of, I am a gazillion percent secure in my status as a non-Egypt. More now than ever, because if I were an Egypt, no one would need to be steamrollering my records. This is a very good thing. Kira and myself agreed passionately with the protesters that Shinead O'Connor and her ilk should get back to Ireland and that she is just an evil woman trying to corrupt our kids with her disrespect, that no way can she be a Christian. We even had our pictures gloriously taken with them for their scrapbooks. They were so proud that two such nice young ladies would support them, poor creatures. After 20 minutes or so, we ladies clambered onto a wooden fence and just sat watching them continue to do their thing walking up and down with the placards. A news crew had turned up because elements of the media had been trying to drum up a huge protest in the previous days. But as it happened, that failed, and the guys were the only protesters for them to film. Next thing we know, a local female TV reporter, brunette, wearing six years' worth of makeup, wanders over to us with her cameraman and her sound guy, who's carrying a ridiculously phallic, fuzzy microphone above her head. Excuse me, miss, 
Are you from around here? She asks. I decide to say, uh, for a very long time. And then I venture, I'm from Saratoga. Kira and me both try not to snot laughing or look at each other. What's your name? The reporter asks. Um, I prefer never to give my name to strangers, I say, and we barely manage not to fall off the fence. Luckily, they went away quickly. We were too bizarre. But they ran it later on the news with the caption, Is that her? Running and rerunning the footage of my interview. Mr. X, a patient here at the Chicago Veterans Administration Hospital, isn't difficult at all, as the nurses had told me he was. He just wants internet. His eyes, whose lower rims have riverbeds in the middles from crying over his son who killed himself some years ago, are almost blind. So he has the hugest TV I've ever seen. It must be 95 inches, literally. He is attached by his nostrils to a large white oxygen machine which is on the floor by his chair, the tubing being long enough to allow him to stand up and walk around. He has emphysema, lifetime of smoking. I see I'm likely to go the same way. He tells me he isn't afraid of dying because he knows he's going to see his son again and that he's been in the hospice for six weeks and didn't want to come in. He is full of life. One would never know he is dying, and I don't ask anyone, even him, how long he has. He's 92, from Syria, fought for America in the Korean War. His wife died 10 years ago. He shows me beautiful photos of them when they were young, going out to dances, all done up and looking so happy together. He has one surviving son, but he lives across the country, so he can't be by his father's bedside. So that's my job for about an hour every day or so for the time being. He is part of a program called No Veteran Dies Alone, companionship on the journey toward death for soldiers who have outlived their families or who just don't have family around for whatever reason. I try to get internet for him, but fail. I don't know why the VA hospital has no Wi-Fi. So his TV may as well be a fish for all it's worth and the only entertainment he has is my ugly face. There's another old gentleman who waits for me every day in the foyer because I baffle him. He's a Nam vet, also 92. He doesn't know if I'm a boy or a girl because I regularly attend the hospital wearing a full Babe Ruth baseball outfit and my head is, of course, shaved. This is a matter of astonishment to the gentleman. The morning after he established I'm female, he's waiting for me again. So are you a lesbian, he asks. No, I tell him. Then why would you cut all your hair off? He's utterly bewildered, but still waits every day for me because he never saw a heterosexual woman with no hair before. He doesn't realize I'm actually asexual. I don't bother enlightening him because he's already too mind blown. There's also a lady I look after, again 92. She was a driver during World War II. She spends all day coloring pictures of Disney princesses. I buy her some fat markers with faces on them. The staff steal them from her right in front of me and I'm horrified. When I push her in her wheelchair for her walks, she snaps out of being the Disney coloring little girl back into being the soldier woman. With no words, but with nods of her head, she shows me where snipers are positioned on the rooftops of the hospital, for real, just in case. So there's no internet, but there are snipers when there's no war. Go figure. I'm lucky because none of my guys or gals die by the time I leave the job, which is voluntary, to return to Ireland. It's the best and most inspiring job I ever had. I have a profound love for soldiers as a result. I had an open surgery radical hysterectomy in Ireland, followed by a total breakdown. As part of my recovery journey, I spent the guts of 2016 and 2017 in different parts of America, 
because the mental health care system in Ireland was failing me. For example, I wasn't offered any hormone replacement therapy. And because no one who knew me wanted anything to do with me, I was so out of my mind that they were all terrified of me. No one had explained to them or me that the loss of one's ovaries would result in what is called surgical menopause, which is menopause times 10,000, and that I might become very unstable. In America, they tell your family these things, and they tell you, the patient. In America, the psych hospitals recognize you've just had your entire womanhood reamed out, and they get you on hormone replacement. There was none of that in Ireland. I left the hospital in Dublin after the hysterectomy with no information, nothing but a bottle of Tylenol and a follow-up appointment to which I dared not go. I'd had to have the surgery because I had chronic endometriosis. I didn't actually need my ovaries taken out too. The doctor just decided he might as well whip them out. My manager sorted me an apartment in the same building as him. But I was so suicidal, I couldn't stay in it for more than a day or two, and I had to keep going to the hospital. In the final of three visits to Englewood Hospital, which took place after scores of visits to Hackensack University Medical Center, and after I parted with my manager, and after I moved into a motel somewhere in New Jersey and got a kidney stone, and made a video appeal on Facebook for someone to come help me, a call comes through for me on the ward from Dr. Phil. I'm thinking, maybe it's my Cinderella moment. He wants to help me. Says his researcher found me via my immigration lawyer, Michael Wilds, because his photo and name had been on my Facebook page. As Phil is introducing himself on the phone, a wine-shirted, blonde-haired healthcare assistant aged about 18, with the palest skin you can imagine, is supervising me, as is the case with all suicidal patients. I was never in any hospital in America that one kind lady wasn't with me all day and another all night. And it's those ladies who made me want to be a healthcare assistant myself, because the talking and giggling with them was more healing than any medicine or therapy. And knowing they'd be there while I was sleeping, was the closest I'd ever felt to being mothered. So it wasn't oppressive being watched, it was loving. Anyway, her skin was so white it was like paper. So when a vicious crazy lady walked by and threw half a cup of boiling tea on the girl's arm and no one came to help her, I felt I had to put the phone down. I made a fuss at the desk that she'd been ignored, in the midst of which I get a note slipped to me by a nurse. Is from the man who was my doctor at Hackensack. He's heard about Dr. Phil, and he agrees with the doctor at Englewood that it would not be healthy to do the show. I think they're both nuts. He's Dr. fucking Phil. He can fix anyone. And they haven't exactly got a clue either, so what have I got to lose? Of course, I'm the crazy one, but sadly, they cannot legally prevent me from leaving the hospital, which would have been in my best interests and I insist on accepting Phil's call back, which comes about 10 minutes after the old lady throws the tea. It's important you understand how desperate for a cigarette one is after a few days and nights in any American psych ward. It's not like Ireland, where the only good thing is they let you smoke. In America, there's fuck all for you but a nicotine patch, and there's no outdoor area. So after a week, you're losing your mind even more than you already were. And so my insistence on abandoning all reason and going to Dr. Phil was in huge part based on my desire to get outside and smoke, and furthermore, smoke some weed, which was also agony to be without at the time. Phil was offering me an eight-hour car ride to a treatment facility he had recommended to some of his guests in America's South. My sneaky addict mind knew that was hours of weed and cigarettes. And yes, sir, it was all the way. I had been introduced to a new lady manager while at the hospital. And we went with the driver and the two-man film crew Phil had sent to my abandoned apartment to meet the weed man. And then I climbed into the big black van, kissed my manager goodbye and sailed off into the night certain that this time I'd be cured. 
I don't mean of smoking. I mean of being angry and suicidal and too full of pain to function outside of hospital. I had been praying that God would send himself to help me in the form of a human being, and I really thought the one God had sent was Dr. Phil. I thought he was literally the answer to my prayers, but I should have known he was batting for the other team because he wasn't spiritually honest. On Jimmy Fallon's show, he was asked how he and I got together. She contacted me, he said. Not true. If he had told the truth, Jimmy might have accused him of exploiting someone while she was very fragile. So after eight hours of driving and smoking and talking, we got to this trauma treatment center in the beautiful ass end of nowhere. The doctors in New Jersey had said, rightly, it transpired, that a trauma treatment would be dangerous because it was so vulnerable. But no one had listened. First bullshit is the people at the center want to take my iPad. They might as well have tried to take my lungs. I ran them around the property in the black of night, then shoved it down my pants and hid in the bushes, while two women roamed around the grounds in a golf cart searching for me and it. In the end, I gave in and they got it. And in protest, I wouldn't take any of my possessions into my room. I told them they could keep everything else I had if they were taking my iPad. Because it's cruel to just take a person's crutch and leave them sitting in their shit with no comfort or distraction for 24 hours a day, especially if their shit happens to be a load of trauma. So I went overnight from having some comfort to zero comfort, and I hated the ladies for it, but only for a day, because it transpired they were lovely, both of them. I meet the psychiatrist at the trunk of his car as I'm stomping back from the garden toward my room. He offers me a fig bar. What the fuck does a rocker want a fig bar for? Is he crazier than me? I tell him, no, thank you. Fig bars are for hippies. I can see we ain't going to be getting along at all. It's late by the time all is settled for the night. I get to bed about 1 a.m. Dr. Phil's show people are coming in the morning because the condition upon which Phil helped me was I had to do the show. And I had to do it before I had any treatments at this place where he had referred me. That way, you don't get to complain on camera afterward about how badly you've been exploited and how reckless your so-called medical care seemed at the place he recommends. I mean, I'm not even sure anyone on my treatment team sought my medical records from any hospitals I had been in, including Englewood, from whence he had plucked me. So they didn't seem to know if I should be subjected to even one hour a week of individual trauma therapy. Never mind nine hours a day. I felt brutalized, making me even more unwell. So anyway, now I'm sitting in front of Dr. Phil, ready to shoot the show, full of hopes and dreams. First thing he says is he's here because my fans wrote to him after my Facebook video and asked him to help me. He waves a vast folder he claims is full of their emailed requests all full of love and support for me. I ask him if I can keep the folder and its contents. He says yes, but forgets to give it to me. He tells me how lucky I am now, because this place I'm in is so opulent, etc. It's got to be the best. He makes me tell him my story on camera. I trust him because I'm vulnerable and I want to live. So I go ahead and let it all hang out. I cry like a baby. He even makes me speak to my mother, the things little Sinead might want to say, which I do, because I think he's helping me. Oh, and also because I'm given the vibe before shooting begins that my being on the show while I'm so fragile is brave and will help others. He goes on about some big producer he knows, swears this guy is going to call me and we're going to make records. When we're filming a final walk around the property, he tells me, he was recently at a meeting attended by Steve Bannon and that the Trump people had actually discussed at that meeting the idea of make America great again being make America white again. He acted all disgusted when telling me. But I figured if he really was that disgusted, he'd be telling the world. That would be spiritual honesty, to risk losing all you have to save the vulnerable to risk being called crazy and being a pariah. No, 
he didn't have the balls. Off he flew in his chopper and I never saw him again. The following day, me and the psychiatrist had a disagreement. He accused me, falsely, of wanting to be treated like a rock star because I'd forgotten to sign out when I was going for smokes. I was insulted because I would never actually want to be treated differently than anyone else in a treatment facility, and it showed me his fig bars had gone to his brain. I was hurt, but I never said a word. I just quietly left his office and went to my room. Apparently, he assumed I was in a rage and he went running off up a hill to get away in case I came after him. That just made me angry when I hadn't been angry. The fucking shrink is a fig-eating pussy and you can't even cry around him or he'll fall to pieces. Jesus Christ. I told him not to put me back in a room with him for fear I'd hit him. So Phil was called and he duly called me. I told him my concerns about the fig eater and the attentiveness of the rest of the staff. I told him also I didn't think I could be fixed, which I still think. I don't fail, Dr. Phil said, and warned me not to be battering the shrink. Things go from bad to worse each time I make a formal complaint about the facility's crew or about the other suicidal girl Phil sent them after a show, sobbing to me about not getting the care she felt she needed, although she said she was having urges. I'm eventually put out of the main facility to live on my own, in a vast, empty, rather grand house that was on the grounds. I'm not allowed into the main house, which makes me very angry, as do the nine hours of trauma therapy every day. One day, in the middle of a marathon trauma therapy session, in walks one of the male staff in charge of legal and accounting. He handed me a contract he wished me to sign, saying, if I recorded anything all the clients did as part of their treatment with the music therapist, the recordings would be owned by the treatment center. Needless to say, I didn't sign, and it's disgusting that anyone would tramp into someone's therapy session for any reason never mind to let that person know you want to take advantage of her. So, I finally lose my shit one night, shouting my head off all over the place, and cops are called because I've said I'm suicidal. I'm taken to the local hospital where they assess that I'm not actually suicidal, but traumatized. They advise me not to return to the treatment center, and the cops then very kindly find me a motel and take me there. In the morning, inside my bag, I find the key to the big house I'd stayed alone in at the treatment centre and stupidly decide to bring it back. I call the only cab driver in town. He tells me he has a bullet in his head from the Korean War and that all the ladies of the town want him. As we drive down the road, I see a beautiful graveyard on our left, white statues and carvings, all giant religious symbols and flowers. On the right side of the road, opposite this, is what looks like an animal graveyard. Maybe a hundred black stones, the size of grapefruits, are in the ground, but there are no discernible graves. The grounds are unkempt, the grass uncut. I ask my driver if it's an animal graveyard. No, he says, that's for the black people, but I don't hang out with them much. I feel my heart rip in two. And now I understand why the one black lady who works at the center was so astonished that it was her hands I chose to cry into when things got too much. She'd been shocked the first time it happened and thanked me as if it were an honor. I go to give the key back and I get talked into going to LA to another treatment center, which I agree to and I'm flown there and dumped. I hear nothing from Phil, although I've been told he's underwriting my stay. After three weeks, one of the staff, in a temper, informs me I'm in fact being put up for nothing by the centre and that what I'd heard at my first facility wasn't the case. No surprises there. I pack up and leave, and I have never heard from any of them since. I wrote a song about all this in 2018. It's called Milestones and will be on my next album, although a demo of it is already out on YouTube. And no, it doesn't mention fig bars. In Islam, 
We believe that in heaven it's always night. I hope so. And I hope if there's a heaven, I qualify. If there's such a situation as not qualifying. I have a hard time believing God would be cruel. But just in case I deserve otherwise, I hope the fact I've sung will make little of my sins, which are ugly and legion. I love fire. I hope there are fires in heaven. Fire makes me strong when I am unable. I also love nighttime best because that's what fire is for. And if my nighttime has no fire in it, nor my dark morning, I am bereft, naked even, as I would be without my hijab. I have worn it since October 2018, not the same one, and yes, I've washed it so my head doesn't smell like a foot when I reverted. We say revert because Islam feels like home. That's what it was like for me as a person who had studied theology since I was a child, like coming home. I searched all my life through every book and every song, and for some reason I left Islam until last. Despite the fact I played the call to prayer before every show for years, I never sat down to study it. I have a hobby I haven't spoken about. I paint scriptures. Been doing it a long time. I usually give them to people, but lately I don't because I've noticed I end up falling out with almost anyone I give one to. When I shuffle off this mortal coil, I want every person to whom I gave a painting to gather in one place and have an exhibition. These people have never met. They are from all walks of life. I'd like them to meet if they haven't trashed the paintings and even if they have. I switched to drawing because every painting took me a month and I'd end up in a hospital from not eating. Painting was like an addiction. I use markers now and gold leaf paint. Easier, same result. It's my way of praying. So I sat down in the middle of some night that October to paint the call to prayer. Praying in another language is like singing. You have to know what you're saying. So I had the English and the Arabic versions and wished to paint the Arabic. I got so blown away by what La ilaha illallah means, there is no God but God, and how it felt in my mouth to say it, the mathematics of it. That was it, I was home. The language and intelligence of the call to prayer led me to listen to the Quran. I was home. I'd been a Muslim all my life and never realized it. The call to prayer is the most mathematically intelligent song ever written. Idolatry, loving something or someone more than God, is anything you love so much you think you would die without it, or you'd want to die without it. Could be a person, place, or thing. You won't know until God decides to show you, but show you he will. A golden calf of your own, and you'll be stunned because you thought you were a true believer. In heaven, they say it's paradise, nighttime paradise, cool and calm, gardens with rivers flowing beneath them. I long for that. So I make it for myself here at night in my sitting room, a fire and darkness, but for it, I picture heaven as a garden, definitely, one that is perfect in climate. And though you wander around so many souls, you don't have to be seen if you don't want to. I do want to, though, be seen. I've never been seen, not even by me. I want to sing wherever I can get away with singing without upsetting God or my granny or my mother. I cause a lot of upset on this earth, being the kind of person I am. I've done only one holy thing in my life, and that was sing. Only the business of music is so unholy. After a while, they begin to clash. You just can't work right because you're in the wrong environment. Kind of like the acid not working in the rockabilly club. My spirit isn't suited for the business of music, nor for anything really other than making songs and performing them, which is my love. Performing, I mean. Born for that. Yes, sir.